So I'm going to tell you uh, about, um, especially about some uh, recent results uh, with uh, Huntington's disease uh, from the point of view of the cell biology. So we're coming from inside the cell, not from the side of the disease. Uh, but uh, what we realize is that uh, in Huntington's, as in other neurodegenerative diseases, um, what uh, could be, effect, be affected and be a, a major factor in the pathogenesis of the disease is uh, the endoplasmic reticulum uh, in which we had uh, specialized. And I'll explain you why it would be affected. So you, uh, as you probably know, and uh, many uh, during neurodegenerative diseases, you have aggregation of proteins, misfolding and aggregation, and you have the development of uh, aggregates or what are co sometimes called uh, deposits or plaques uh, that can be outside of the cells or inside of the cells, uh, also called inclusions or inclusion bodies. And this happens, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, uh, Huntington's disease, uh, ALS, and also uh, in the prion diseases. So this is common to all these uh, diseases, and you have uh, the formation of uh, these uh, tangles or fibrils, uh, which um, seem to have quite similar structures between the different uh, proteins that are misfolding, depending on the disease. So we chose to study um, Huntington's disease uh, because, uh, as I was uh, telling you, we thought that it might be uh, affecting uh, rather indirectly the endoplasmic reticulum, and this could cause a major effect uh, on the cells, of toxicity in the cells. And just a few words on the Huntington's uh, disease. So this is a an autosomal dominant uh, genetic disease, uh, incidence about 1 in 10,000. And uh, one reason we, why we chose this model is because the, uh, ge the genetic determinant is very well defined. It's one gene uh, that uh, encodes for the hunting team protein uh, with a mutation. Um, this uh, protein is a large protein, 350 kilodaltons, uh, expressed in the cytosol and the nucleus of uh, cells. And the, this protein has in, uh, in its exon 1, near the end terminus of the protein, a repeat of a CAG in the gene that encodes for uh, glutamines. So this gives a polyglutamine uh, uh, stretch, several glutamines uh, in, a, in a line. And if there are less than uh, uh, about 35 uh, glutamines, so the protein is normal. So we all have this Huntington protein uh, with less than uh, 35 glutamines. If uh, a person has a Huntington with uh, more than uh, 35 uh, glutamines. So then there's this uh, interesting correlation where you have here uh, the length of the repeat and the age of onset of the disease. And you can see that uh, there's, a, there's a very nice uh, correlation, uh, very nice. Uh, you, you have uh, with uh, the longer the repeat, the earlier the age of onset. Okay, and uh, after onset, uh, there's a series of uh, symptoms that start, uh, and uh, death in about uh, 10 years after the onset. And there's no therapy for the moment. And uh, uh, this disease uh, first uh, shows uh, symptoms in the striatum. It's a uh, part of the of the brain becomes affected, there's loss of neurons, and then afterwards it, uh, it moves to other regions of the brain cortex. And um, what you have is, uh, uh, in this disease, uh, first uh, cognitive uh, problems, and 
uh, with time, there's a development of uh, motor system, uh, symptoms and uh, a characteristic, uh, what, uh, what's called Huntington's chorea, uh, these uh, problems uh, in motor function. And there are several, uh, there are many studies on Huntington's disease, but still uh, many open questions. And uh, one of them is, why the selective loss of neurons in the striatum? So it's not known why the striatum is, is specifically affected. The protein is expressed in all cells of the body and in all cells of the brain. So why is the striatum specifically affected? And this is one of the questions that, that we are addressing in the lab. I'll just touch a little bit on this, but this won't be the main subject of the talk. The other uh, open question is, uh, is the protein aggregates that are formed in, in Huntington's disease uh, are harmful or are actually protective? And this is an open question actually in the neurodegenerative field for many of the diseases. Uh, if, the, uh, if the aggregates are actually a, a secondary effect of the disease uh, or though they might actually be protective. Yeah? So I'll try to show you some of the results that we have uh, connected to this. So our hypothesis uh, was the following. That there have been uh, many cellular effects seen uh, by the aggregation of uh, Huntington, though the cause of the toxicity, the death of the cells, is uh, not actually known. Uh, and one of the effects that had been seen is inhibit, inhibition of proteasomes, the degradation of machinery and the cytosol. So uh, the simplistic idea is that uh, the Huntington aggregates and the proteasomes have problems in degrading these aggregates, and then they get stuck trying to degrade them, and this uh, then takes the proteasome machinery, inhibits it, and this in, uh, inhibits the degradation of proteins in the cell, and this from the cytosol but also from the endoplasmic reticulum, because uh, they're all, all the time uh, misfolded or simply accumulated, unfolded proteins from the ER, going from the ER to the cytosol to be degraded by the proteasomes. And if you inhibit the proteasomes, you accumulate these proteins, calling what's called ER stress. So what is ER stress? First of all, ER stress had been found, actually, in Huntington's disease in the lab of uh, Susan Lindquist and in other labs, one of them uh, here in, in, in Trieste, actually. Um, and uh, what is ER stress? So ER stress is the accumulation of unfolded or uh, misfolded secretory proteins in the ER. Uh, or as I will show you in a compartment that we call the ERQC, ER uh, derived quality control compartment. So this is a specialized part of the ER where there's accumulation of misfolded or unfolded proteins. And this ER stress, again, the accumulation of unfolded and misfolded proteins causes a response which is compensatory, which is called the unfolded protein response. So the unfolded protein response then tries to uh, correct this uh, situation uh, by increasing the machinery that can fold the proteins. It senses that there are unfolded proteins. You need more machinery to fold them. This is one. It increases the machinery to degrade them because there's accumulated proteins. You want to degrade them and release the load in the air, etc. So this is uh, the initial response. But if the ER stress continues, built in the uh, into the machinery of the UPR, you have a pathway towards apoptosis, cell death. So if the problem cannot be corrected, the cell is very problematic for the organism. It should be killed. And this is what happens. And so the hypothesis is that if Huntington is inhibiting protocells, it could cause ER stress. And this persistent ER stress, because you have all the time this aggregation of the mutant Huntington, it could lead to cell death and neurodegeneration. 
And if it's happening in neurons, it would be neuronal loss. <coughs> so um, what we had seen uh, in studies of uh, ER-associated degradation and, and ER stress is that initially, so this is the, would be the net of the ER, and initially you get a misfolded uh, proteins that if they accumulate, they don't stay uh, distributed in the ER, but they actually congregate in a region of the, that uh, we call, as I told you, the ERQC, which is in the pericentriolar region of the cell around the centrosome. Okay, so the proteins, they move there through microtubules. And when you get the accumulation of these uh, misfolded or unfolded proteins, this recruits chaperones, uh, the machinery for ERAD, and also the UPR sensors, the proteins that sense and, uh, and, and, and signal then the unfolded protein response. Other uh, chaperones, for example, the abundant BIP does not uh, concentrate there. It remains distributed in the rest of the ER. From here, you would get ERAD, because the ERAD machinery is here. The proteins would move, move to the cytosol, to the ubiquitin proteasome system, to be degraded. And uh, as I said, the, this accumulation of proteins uh, causes the unfolded protein response, but at the same time here you have the UPR sensors that are sensing this, and this amplifies the response, so you would have an amplification of the response by this compartmentalization and concentration of the protein. So where is Huntington? So Huntington would be inhibiting the ubiquitin proteasome system, inhibiting ERAD, causing the accumulation of proteins, causing ER stress, and with, again, with prolonged ER stress, this would lead to cell death. Apoptosis, and I won't get into the mechanisms uh, of apoptosis from, uh, from ER stress. But I will talk to you a little bit more about this uh, compartment. So what we had seen is that uh, when we looked at uh, proteins that are degrading through ERAD, so normally you see them like in ER pattern. So you have the nucleus here, and the protein distributed in, in the ER. So this is would be de novo made protein. Uh, okay, and then soon after that it's degraded by ERAD. And if the protein accumulates, for example, if we inhibit the proteasomal degradation, like with lactocysteine, a proteasomal inhibitor, it, it doesn't stay distributed in the ER, but it accumulates in the region around uh, the centrosomes, as I said. And uh, we're using a lot this model ERAD substrate that I won't have time to talk about, which is, uh, we call it, which is called the uncleave precursor of a cyanoglycoprotein receptor H2A. This is a, a membrane a protein and that uh, is expressed naturally in hepatocytes. And there in hepatocytes, it gets uh, cleaved and, and uh, releases a soluble form that is secreted. But if you express this protein in, in, in other cell types, it remains uncleaved and it's sent to ERAD. It's not correctly processed, and then it's recognized as something aberrant and sent uh, to ERAD. And, um, and here you see if you inhibit the, the, its degradation, you accumulate in this compartment. Also, we saw with many other uh, substrates of ERAD that the same thing happens, glycosylated or non-glycosylated they all accumulate in, in this region when you inhibit their degradation. Or when they're, for example, uh, overexpressed. If, it depends on the level of, of the protein. Normally you would see it, you'd see the de novo protein, and as soon as it gets to this region, it's degraded, so you don't see it anymore. But if, only if you inhibit the degradation or if it's uh, at high levels, then, uh, then you see it. Just to give you an example, of a, a, for example, ERAD machinery that accumulates a, in this place. Do you see well the fluorescence? Yes. It's too much light or no? It's okay. Uh, so 
This is, for example, a Derlin one, a component of the ERED machinery. And this is together again with the H2A, the protein that uh, the substrate degrading, uh, uh, linked in this case to red fluorescent protein. So you can see that uh, it's distributed in the ER. When you inhibit the degradation of the H2A, then uh, Derlin also accumulates in this uh, region and they mostly overlap. And here, uh, another protein. So Derlin is a membrane protein of the ER. In this case, uh, we're looking at the cytosolic chaperone, P97, also called VCP. And that's uh, in the cytosol and nucleus in normal conditions. And uh, we, when you inhibit uh, the degradation and express the, the ured substrate, so much of the protein uh, concentrates also in this region. So this is from the cytosolic side. And as I said, uh, an example of uh, a protein that does uh, not concentrate uh, there, a uh, BIP. So this is a BIP in its ER pattern together with uh, H2A. And this is if you inhibit the degradation of H2A. And you can see that BIP uh, does not concentrate in this region, remains distributed in the ER. Oops. And here we're looking at, in this case, we're looking at the cell line that's a stable transfectant, stably expressing in H2A. And even in untreated cells, you have a small population of cells that express more of the protein, and it already accumulates without inhibiting. So this does not depend on proteosomal inhibition. It's just accumulation of the protein and that causes this accumulation in this uh, region near the nucleus. And you can see, again, that BIP is uh, uh, relatively depleted from this uh, region. Okay, so this is a, a natural process that occurs on, upon accumulation of the misfolded protein. And this is just to make a long story short, uh, just a table of, uh, of several components that accumulate, for example, chaperones like calnexin and calreticulin, uh, and this uh, central enzyme for the ER quality control. So I won't have time to get into details with the many studies with the ER monosidase one. So all these proteins accumulate in this uh, ERQC. While others do not beep, ERP57, PDI, the, the oxidoreductase, for example, they, they do not uh, accumulate in this region in response to the accumulation of a misfolded secretory protein. And I told you about the ERAD components, so many ERAD components, we saw them concentrating in this region. And interestingly, the UPR sensors, so these two, uh, Proteins IRE1 and PERC, they concentrate in this compartment. And interestingly, from the cytosolic side, this EIF2 alpha, the phosphorylated form, I'll show you that this is part of the UPR, the, the part of the response that comes after your stress. And it also uh, concentrates in this region. So one important thing here, I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about the UPR in a minute, is that you have a separation in these conditions of uh, ER stress, you have a separation of BIP from the UPR sensors. And what happens is that BIP usually keeps the UPR sensors in an inactive form. So if you separate them, and here we have a physical separation, uh, you, you actually activate uh, the UPR. So back uh, to this uh, scheme, so again, where does a hunting team, where would hunting team get in? It would inhibit uh, ERAD and cause ER stress. And the question is, does it really inhibit ERAD? And this we checked, uh, again, we're looking at our model ERAD substrate, the H2A, now by pulse chase analysis. And we were looking at a pulse chase in the presence of a wild-type Huntington, 20 glutamines, 
And here you have a, a normal uh, degradation of the protein. It's disappearing with time. And this is if we express the uh, polyglutamine expanded huntington, the pathogenic uh, huntington. And you can see that there's a very strong stabilization of the protein. So it does seem to be inhibiting ERA. And importantly, we did this in the striatal cells, which are the most relevant for the disease, right? As I told you at the beginning. A little bit more about the UPR. So is this causing, OK, it inhibits ERA. Does this cause uh, UPR, your stress and, and, and induction of the UPR? So a little bit more about the UPR. So in mammalian cells, uh, you have three branches of the UPR. One is with this sensor that I mentioned before, uh, IRE1 on the membrane of the ER, and, or as I told you, of this ERQC compartment. And uh, IRE1, when it becomes activated, uh, it causes uh, this unusual uh, splicing event on the mRNA that encodes for this uh, transcription factor XPP1, becomes spliced, and this splice form now is activated. It's expressed as a protein and activated, and goes to the nucleus to induce a transcription of genes. The second branch has also a membrane protein sitting on the membrane of the ERQC, the PERC protein. And PERC is a kinase, and it phosphorylates this translation factor, protein involved in protein synthesis, EIF2 alpha becomes phosphorylated. I mentioned EIF2 alpha before. And uh, this phosphorylation of this uh, translation factor inhibits general protein translation in the cells. So there's a stop in protein synthesis. And, and the logic for this is that the cell wants to stop any more synthesis because there are unfolded proteins being made. You want to stop for a moment any more uh, synthesis of proteins. But also through an unusual uh, pathway, there's an activation of translation of this transcription factor ATF4. Okay, so there's more ATF4 made. It goes to the nucleus, induces transcription. And the third branch is through this also membrane uh, protein of the R, ATF6. And ATF6 becomes activated. It, it, it's already a transcription factor, but it's bound to the membrane. This region becomes cleaved. The ATF6 is released, goes to the nucleus. And a couple of things. So one is that in all cases, BIP that I mentioned before, keeps the sensors in the inactive form, like IRE1 and PERC uh, remain as monomers. When BIP, when there, are, when there is accumulation of unfolded proteins, they bind BIP, they displace them from the sensors. The sensors then dimerize and become activated. Okay, in the case of IRE1 and PERC, in the case of HTF6, BIP keeps it in the ER, when BIP is displaced, ETF6 travels to the Golgi, and this cleavage is in the Golgi. When the transcription factors get into the nucleus, they induce transcription of what? Of, as I mentioned before, chaperones, to try to fold better the proteins. Uh, ERAD factors, like the Derlin that I mentioned, HRD1, et cetera, okay, to degrade more the unfolded proteins. And uh, in the long term, there's induction also of pro-apoptotic factors like CHOP, for example. Okay, so this is a bit of, on the UPR. So now, is there induction of the UPR? So what we did here is uh, we expressed a um, pathogenic form of a uh, hunting thing. And uh, we are looking here, what, what we did here is we separated soluble form, form aggregates, in detergent and soluble aggregates of the Huntington. You can see that with time, after transfection, it's becoming aggregated, 
and there's a reduction in the soluble form. Okay, so it's becoming more and more aggregated. And if we look at the, here in, in, in this blot at one of the UPR factors, the phosphorylated EIF2 alpha, you can see that there's an increase with time in correlation with the increase in the presence of aggregates of hunting. And if we look at the other markers, like the GAD34, this is a late pro-apoptotic uh, uh, member of the UPR, also an increase with the increase of insoluble aggregates. So this is the, what's called the PERC branch, one of the branches of UPR. If we look at the ATF6 also, uh, there's an increase with the presence of aggregates. And also the third branch, the IRD1. So we're looking at the splicing. Remember the splicing event? So we're looking at spliced XPP1. And it's also in, uh, increasing in correlation with the presence of aggregates. In the case of uh, this branch, we can uh, use an interesting system where we can see in individual cells what's happening. And this is because of the splicing. So the IRE1 splices, as I told you, the XPP1 mRNA. And if we have the XPP1 link linked to a fluorescent uh, protein, so initially, in normal, normal conditions, there's a stop codon. So there's no expression of a fluorescent protein. But if there's this, uh, upon ER stress, there is this uh, splicing event, the fluorescent protein becomes in frame, okay, after the splicing, and now you have a fluorescent protein being made. So if we look at the individual cells, if you can see this, uh, if we have a wild type hunting team you can see its expression here, and, and no fluorescence of the XPP1 uh, Venus, okay? And if you express the pathogenic hunting team, and here you see a cell with an aggregate, and you can see that the cell with the aggregate uh, lights up, okay? So, so you can see an in individual cell's development of uh, an early stage of the UPR. And now we, we looked at this very early event also, which is the accumulation of the proteins in this ERQC compartment. And here, looking at the striatal cells again, if we look at now cells that have the pathogenic hunting team, but in a soluble distributed form, not, in, not, aggreg not aggregated as we can see in cells, and there's little or no accumulation of the H2A, the, e, the ERAD substrate. <coughs> but if you, we look at cells with aggregates, see this, this large Huntington aggregate, you can see there's a strong accumulation of the ERAD protein. And this is a, another cell. This is just to show that the Huntington can aggregate in the cytosol or in the nucleus in this case, and you always have this strong accumulation of the ERAD pro the, the ERAD protein, the ERAD substrate. And uh, there's no correlation between the location of the Huntington and the location of the ER protein. And this happens also in other cell types, like for example here NIH53, you have the aggregate and the accumulation, but you can see that it's, it's a lesser accumulation. So in, already in striatal cells, you have something different, which is a very strong uh, response. A, what I showed you so far was using a form of Huntington, a, a mutant that's only expressing the exon 1, that has, has this polyglutamine uh, repeat. And what if we look at uh, the full-length uh, Huntington? And also here we're looking at this cell line, a stable cell line, stably expressing the Huntington. And we can see that if you have the wild type, there is a little expression of this phosphorylated AF2 alpha, again, the early marker of the UPR. But uh, the basal levels of this 
phosphorylated F2 alpha and the cells with the pathogenic antigen are much higher. Okay, so this is a, so there's a larger basal UPR, so constant DR stress in these cells. And the same for the kinase that phosphorylates this uh, form. What about mice? So here we looked at a mouse model of a Huntington's uh, disease expressing, uh, again, a polyglutamine form of the Huntington. And, well, I don't know if you can see. Well, these are sections, brain sections, looking at uh, the region of the striatum uh, of the brain. And normal mice are in this Huntington's uh, model. And you, can, and you have a significant increase also in the phosphorylation of IF2-alpha in, uh, in these Huntington model mice. Uh, what about the cell death, the, late, the latest stages uh, coming for your stress? Is there a cell death coming from ER stress and cells expressing the pathogenic Huntington? So we look here at this uh, stable cell line that I showed you before, this triatal cell line. Uh, now this is a cell line, and as any cell line, it, it doesn't die easily, right? So they're, they're uh, they're quite resistant, they're, they're adapted. But in the case of your stress, if you give them an extra push, so if you uh, incubate cells with this uh, uh, drug tunicamycin that causes uh, ER stress, tunicamycin, you may know it as a, a glycosylation inhibitor. So it inhibits glycosylation of all, all glycoproteins. So you have many glycoproteins, and when, not, they, when they are not glycosylated, they misfold and they cause, they accumulate, it causes your stress. So if you give them tunicomycin to the cells and, and, and wait for many hours, the cells start to die. And if you look at striatal cells compared to other cell lines like the NH33 or this N2A neuroblastoma, what we saw is that uh, they were much more sensitive. Also the wild type, the ones expressing the wild type Huntington. They were much more sensitive than the other cells. So there's something different than the striatal cells that makes them more sensitive to ER stress. If we look at the same cells, but now expressing the pathogenic Huntington, they're even much more sensitive. Okay, so they're very sensitive to ER stress. And at this point, we made an educated uh, guess, uh, which was, uh, trying to see what, is, uh, what could be causing uh, this CR stress. Because uh, again, the Huntington is in the cytosolar nucleus and we're looking at things, events in the ER, right? Um, so this uh, P97 BCP, I mentioned it before, the cytosolic uh, chaperon, it had, it's known to be essential for ERAD. And it also had been seen separately um, that it was uh, sequestered uh, during the aggregation of Huntington. And so we said, okay, well, maybe there's a depletion of uh, this P97. And uh, in fact, uh, when we look at cells, here we're looking again at this uh, early UPR marker, the phosphorylated F2 alpha. Here, when we express the pathogenic Huntington, we have a large increase and the uh, uh, phosphorylated F2 alpha. But when we co-express, over-express the VCP, we can see a, a very strong uh, reduction. So uh, what we think is that this P97 is being depleted during the aggregation of Huntington. And just by uh, over-expressing it, we compensate for the ER stress. Uh, so, what do we have and so far? That uh, Huntington, the pathogenic form, inhibits ERAD. It causes the accumulation of misfolded proteins in the ER, causes ER stress, activation of the three branches, as I showed you. Um, the effect is especially strong in striatal cells, I showed you. Uh, the effect 
is seen also with the mutant Huntington and exon one, just expressing the exon one, or with the full length Huntington in striatal cells, or also in mouse uh, brain striatal. Uh, I showed you that the striatal cells are especially sensitive to ER stress, and that p 97 vcp seems to play a, a major role in protecting against this uh, ER stress. When it's depleted, we have the stress. Now, we remained with uh, an important question and uh, risking uh, and, and asking one question too many. Uh, on the other hand, Voltaire had said, judge a man by his questions rather than by his answers, so we took the risk. The question is, uh, the question that I, I put at the beginning is, uh, is it uh, what we is what we're seeing caused by the aggregates or by oligomeric forms that are before aggregation? Actually, could the aggregates be protective? Now, from what I've showed you so far, it looks like it's the aggregates, right? You have an increase in aggregation, as I showed you, and those blots, an increase correlative of you know the UPR marker seems to be the aggregates. If you look at individual cells, you see the lighting up of the UPR only in cells that have the aggregates and not in cells that have the same protein, but it's not aggregated. So it does seem to be the aggregates. But there's a problem here uh, in that uh, this is pro what happens if you have a formation of oligomers of the Huntington and the oligomers convert to aggregates, but this conversion is very fast. So we wouldn't be separating in time the oligomerization process from the aggregation process. So it could be that we're look, seeing that it seems to correlate with aggregates, but it could be that it's actually the oligomers that are forming at the same time. Could we separate these two events? And this is uh, what we tried to do by expressing the Huntington uh, in an inducible system, a TETOF system. So in this TETOF system, uh, we can shut off the synthesis of Huntington by incubating cells with doxycycline. And what we did is we uh, transfect the cells. We wait different, for different periods of time for the expression. And then we do like a, like a chase, shutting off the synthesis. And this is uh, what we get if we look at the soluble form and the aggregates. So the, the aggregates, that they, they appear with time. And now what we can do is we take, can take the soluble form and see, se try to separate oligomers there that are soluble. And we did this by gl a glycerol gradient sized fractionation. And so we're taking fractions from the glycerol gradient here. And you can see the oligomers are appearing in this region. And these are the monomers. And you can see with the, these times, there are the times that are, that are up here, uh, you can see that Oligomers are appearing and then disappearing again. They're probably converting to aggregates, right? That appear with time. And if we look now at the UPR markers, so this is a, what we get with the oligomers appearing, disappearing. The aggregates continue to accumulate. We have a, a time point then where we have only aggregates, basically and at time points where we have more oligomers than aggregates. Now let's see at those time points what happens with the UPR. And this is what we have. This is uh, looking at BIP, XPP1, GAT34. Uh, we can see that uh, they all follow a curve that seems to correspond to the oligomers, right? So you have an appearance and then the levels go down even if the aggregates, they continue to accumulate. Okay, so it seems that the more aggregates, more aggregates don't correlate with more UPR. The UPR seems to correlate with the oligomers. Can we get a better resolution? Because in the biochemical experience, you're looking at many cells, right? The average of a population, which is not synchronized exactly. Can we look at the individual cells? Now, the problem with individual cells, as I showed you, that only when we have aggregates, you have the, uh, the UPR or the concentration of the protein and the ERQC, and not if the protein is soluble. 
But in this case, as you can see, what we did is we linked fluorescent protein, uh, cherry red fluorescent protein to the Huntington and GFP to the ER protein. And so what we can do now is follow uh, with time uh, what's happening, okay, and get a, try to get a better resolution. And this is what we do here. If you can see, there's uh, cells here. This is, we're looking just at the Huntington and it's a soluble distributor, and this cell has a small aggregate. We look one hour later, the aggregate grows, and here there's more fluorescent, but still not aggregated. Here it's still not aggregated, one hour more. One hour more, poof, everything aggregates, okay? And it takes all the protein from the cell. So this happens quite fast, right, in the matter of one hour. And if we look closer, it's actually in the matter of minutes that there's this aggregation process that we're hunting. And now let's look together with the ER protein. And so here you can see this is the ER protein, and this is the Huntington. It's, it's soluble. I don't know if you can see. It's not aggregated. And here you can see it's already starting to accumulate. You see? It's accumulating, accumulating, no aggregate. Accumulating, accumulating. This is the ER QC. No aggregate, no aggregate. Ah, here, there appears the aggregate. Okay, so very clearly, and the aggregate, again, the, it accumulates, uh, it aggregates in a matter of minutes, takes out most of the hunting team from the cell, uh, but very clearly, the uh, ER protein is accumulating much before the aggregation, uh, the appearance of uh, hunting team aggregates. So the conclusion is that ER stress develops before the aggregation starts. The aggregation into this large, uh, what we call insoluble, detergent insoluble aggregates and biochemical experiments or visible aggregates in the cells. If we analyze many cells this way, so this is what we get. This is for the signal for Huntington down here. Uh, and so here, uh, this is how much of the protein is in an aggregate. So we, we just quant quantify the fluorescence in this small region. So there's none, and then time zero is the time of where we, the visible aggregates appears, and you have this sigmo sigmoidal curve, sudden appearance, and, and, and very quickly it forms an aggregate that takes most of the hunting team into the aggregate. And if we look at the R protein, we can see that much before zero, much before the aggregation of the Huntington, we get the accumulation in the ERQC. Okay, so this is a, there's an accumulation starting about two hours before the aggregation. If we look at cells that don't aggregate at all the Huntington, we don't get this. So it's something that happens before the aggregation, but the aggregation has to happen. It's during the aggregation process, it's in the formation of the oligomers, as I showed you before. If we look at what happens after the zero, after the aggregation, there seems to be very little change, or maybe there's a, a slowing down of the accumulation of the ER protein. Now, this we can see it better if we plot in a different way. So what we're plotting here, instead of uh, against time, what we're doing, again, uh, ah, I didn't mention each, uh, each line here, each color is a different cell, right? And here also, each color is a different cell, and each point is a time point. And so we measure for each time point uh, how much of the ER protein is in the ERQC and how much Huntington is aggregated. So while there's no aggregated Huntington, the ER protein accumulates, accumulates before aggregation. And you can see for most, cur for most cells, when aggregation starts, so, there's no more increase in the concentration of the ER protein or it becomes very slow. Also, in the time of the experiment, it, does, it, it doesn't reduce or almost doesn't reduce. So that means that the ER stress that causes this accumulation remains for the time of the experiment. It's, it, it's not being reduced. It takes a long time to be reduced. Very interesting is if we look at cells 
that are um, have aggregates from the beginning, and they formed before the uh, <coughs> experiment started, the observation started, they had aggregates. We don't know from when. And we can see that here, if we look at how much H2A is in the ERQC and how much antigen in aggregates, there's very little change during the experiment. It means that, okay, the most of antigen is already recruited there, and the, there's no increase in the ER stress. So each cell is in a different position where uh, it's in, like in, a, uh, in equilibrium at different states, right? And interestingly, it doesn't depend on the concentration of the hunting team, right? There's cells that have a, most of the hunting team in the aggregate and relatively low concentration of the ER protein. And you can see the opposite. You can see cells with not too much hunting team in the aggregate and a lot of ER stress shown by the ER protein. Okay, so the... Again, there's no correlation between the presence of aggregate and the stress itself. So I'm getting to the end. So the conclusion is that uh, the ER stress uh, develops before HTT, Huntington, is invisible uh, aggregates. At the aggregates, uh, the growth of the aggregates and the size of the aggregates it does not uh, determine uh, ER stress. It's something that happened before. But it takes a long time after the formation of the large aggregates for ER stress to be reduced. Is it reduced? Y yes. In the long term, yes, because uh, this we saw, remember the curves in the biochemical experiment, that the aggregates were, were increasing at long times, but the stress was already decreasing. So it does seem to be decreased with time. There seems to be actually a protection in the long term. So this is the model that we have. Um, what we would have is monomers of hunting team forming uh, toxic oligomers. And the toxic oligomers uh, would sequester uh, P97 VCP and many other proteins. Um, and this would cause ERAD that needs uh, the VCP. If uh, you inhibit ERAD, you accumulate ER unfolded proteins, you cause ER stress. In the long term, ER stress causes apoptosis. At some point, uh, and, and again, this is not depend doesn't seem to be dependent on content in concentration, it seems to be a random, what's called a random seeding event, there's an aggregation, and the aggregation would take most of, would suck most of the all monomers, so the all monomers cannot form any more toxic oligomers, so this would be a protective response. And, but the toxic oligomers, they remain for some time, they seem to convert very slowly to aggregates, or uh, with time they could be degraded, but also they are degraded. There's problem in degrading the oligomers. This, this is known. Okay, so they are toxic oligomers. They remain for a relatively long time. But the aggregation process actually seems to be protected. Uh, graphically, if we want to see it, uh, uh, let's look at the, here. We, have, we start with a native protein. The native protein misfolds. This would be the hunting team. And then it forms oligomers. The oligomers form these fibrils or large aggregates. At the beginning, just to simplify, you would have hydrophobic regions that, as you know, they are buried and usually inside a native properly fold protein. If it misfolds, these regions become exposed. And with the, uh, the formation of oligomers, the conformation of these oligomers could, could expose even more these hydrophobic regions here in blue. But when you have formation of a large aggregate, there could be a change in conformation where these hydrophobic regions are covered. Now, the hydrophobic regions are sticky, and they are the ones that sequester, bind all kinds of factors like VCP. And so the aggregates could be actually uh, protecting and not 
making the protein less sticky. And the misfolded proteins could be degraded at the beginning, or they could be covered by chaperones protecting these regions. You would need more chaperones for the oligomers. The oligomers, on the other hand, they're degrading more slowly. So you would need more and more chaperones. At some point, you get saturation. And there are, not, there are not enough chaperones, so it would remain with sticky oligomers, which would be the toxic spe uh, species. Could these, the, so this is just a, a model. So this would sequester many proteins. This is, a, this is just a model. Could be uh, close to reality. Uh, it might be. This is a, from very nice work by uh, David uh, Eisenberg at UCLA. So what they have been doing is uh, looking at, uh, actually, the structures of oligomers and, uh, and fibrils and, and uh, measuring energy. So this is actually from real uh, structural data and biophysical data. Uh, and the oligomers are relatively stable. They have relatively f low free energy. So, okay, so they can accumulate. Uh, to convert to aggregates, they have to pass an energy barrier. But once they get to these aggregates of fibrils, there's a, there's a very strong drop in the free energy, it means that the fibrils are very, very stable. The fibrils actually f are in this very highly ordered structures, which they call dry steric zippers. Why dry? Because the hydrophobic regions, as I showed in the model, they are buried and very tightly bound in the center of these uh, fibrils and, and, and not exposed. Dry then because not, the water can't, can't get in. It's very tightly bound. Okay, so, so this uh, actually uh, could be related to the model that I was showing uh, in that uh, the aggregates would have their problematic hydrophobic regions buried and protecting Protected, uh, protecting the cell from toxicity. So I went a little bit too long. Uh, this is a, I'm finished, this is my, my uh, lab. And this work, most of the work that I showed you is uh, by a very talented uh, graduate student, uh, Julia uh, Leitman. And the work was done in collaboration with Ulrich Hartel at the, the Max Planck in, in Martins Reed. And some of the work in collaboration with Uriah Shetty from Tel Aviv University. Thank you.